Good morning and happy Sabbath uh, to our, all our church families and to the Lemur Church and to the Kolinga Church. We uh, present this for you on the Sabbath. We um, want to uplift two families uh, today as we think about um, the needs of those in our church. Uh, Shani Gibbons and her family and Tony um, Gutierrez and the family. They have special situations and uh, we w do want to uplift them in prayer. So uh, let's uh, open with prayer right now. Lord, we thank you that once again, we as a church can come together to hear your word and to praise you. We uplift Shani Gibbons and her family and Tony Gutierrez's family. And we, um, we ask that you bless their situations, their families, and, and give them a healing in bo both body and in spirit. You know the situation. Father, we also uh, remember Mary Lou and David Lou, who has been in the hospital and is recovering right now. We ask that you put your healing uh, powers in hand on them also. And uh, also we pray for all those who are suffering right now with uh, in the Gulf states and the, with Hurricane Laura and the other disasters, the fires west of Coalinga and the results. In the, uh, we, we just pray for those who have been affected and that your peace will be upon them. So Lord, we, uh, we praise you and we ask that you will bless these words and uh, bless the hearers that are uh, at the sound of my voice. And uh, we ask this in your holy, uh, in your holy name we say amen. In the middle of March, everything around us was closed down for two weeks. We were told it was to reduce the spread of COVID-19 to flatten the curve. The medical experts urged our government officials to close everything, schools, gyms, theaters, cinemas, hair salons, barbershops, restaurants, dental and medical offices, shopping malls, and all the non-essential businesses as well as our churches, all closed. Even hospitals were not allowed to treat non-emergency procedures. And two weeks has turned into five months and a half now. As we've been in quarantine, most of us have spent our time trying to figure out the new normal, the new normal of working from home, the new normal with our finances, the new normal of parenting while being with our kids all day, or the new normal of grandparenting our grandchildren while in isolation, the new normal of our marriage, in our marriage, being uh, with our spouse all day. I say, oh, heavenly bliss. But I think for most of us, there's a lot of emotion in it, not just stress and pressure about the virus, and our health concerns, but stress compounded by parenting, marriage, work, finance, and health all coming together. Is it, defi it is definitely squeezing each of us. The question is, when life squeezes us, what comes out? The truth is that whatever is in us comes out. We may be subjected to, subject to circumstances beyond our control, situations that are not a result of our own choosing. The only thing that we have control over is our response to the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Do we simply react or do we consciously act? The virus and the quarantine are the circumstances that are squeezing us, but our emotional response can only be cr um, credited to or blamed on the condition of our hearts. Have we been nurturing our hearts with spiritual nourishment? Have we been spending some time each day with God in God's word? Have we spent time communing with our creator God, inviting him and allowing him to change our hearts and mold our character? Or have we been filling our time and minds with the secular things of this world. Television, movies, sports, entertainment of every sort, shopping and ev uh, whenever we can, and every worldly indulgence you can think of. Now, don't think that I'm 
judging or judging too hard for many of these secular things like work, education, relaxation with friends or hobbies. These are all good uses of time. But I'm saying let us not spend so much time in these diversions that we leave out time communing with our loving Father God. Whatever we see, whatever we hear, we th whatever we think about affects our character and our heart. We are admonished to guard our hearts in Proverbs 4.23. It, it states, above all else, <clears throat> guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Hence the flow of emotions when we are squeezed. We guard our hearts by guarding what we experience through what we watch and what we listen to and what we think about. <clears throat> when we think about emotions, the one question that often comes to mind is, are emotions good or are they bad? Great things have been done in our world driven by emotions. At the same time, wicked things have been done in our world driven by emotions. In reality, emotions in themselves are not totally good or totally bad. When we look at scriptures, we see that God created us with emotions. God has emotions, Jesus had emotions, and Jesus has emotions now. In one moment, we rejoice in the praises of God, but later, our same heart will rage with anger against, against our mate or children. At times, emotions are a mystery. They control us and at times even ruin us. If God gave them to us, then there must be a way for us to honor God with our emotions. But how? Our emotions come from our thoughts, and throughout the Bible, we are instructed to think on good things. In Philippians 4, 8, God tells us, Finally, brothers and sisters, uh, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We must fight to keep our hearts and minds focused on what is good. This is re a really broad topic, but in my, in my talk today, we will at least gather some biblical ways of thinking about emotions. We are all emotional beings. When studying the Bible, we don't see one specific chapter that talks completely about emotions, but we do see emotions all throughout Scripture of emotional beings. God's Word teaches us about anger, joy, worry, sadness, and loneliness. Some stories in Scripture show us emotions that praised God, and others show us what people felt when they rebelled against God. So how do we discern which of our emotions are righteous and which ones are sinful? The best place to start is by looking at the life of Jesus. In Matthew 22, verse 37, 40, Jesus was asked, which is the greatest commandment? The setting was just after the Sadducees had failed in testing Jesus on the question of marriage in heaven, and they were all astonished at his answer. Then a Pharisee lawyer asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? So Matthew twenty two thirty seven says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus was referring to and quoting Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 through 6. Love your Lord, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words... Uh, these words, commandments that I, are commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. I like to say also, verse 7, I'll add, that impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you, are, when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up and when you're in quarantine. Leviticus 19, 18 says, Do not seek revenge 
or bear a grudge against one of your, your, well, your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So the spirit of prophecy tells us that Jesus was the first one of all the scholars that came before him and that were in the crowd there that day, the Sadducees and Pharisees and lawyers and, and the, the like. The, he was the first one to link this, this the first text and Levitic, Leviticus and Deuteronomy together. And the Pharisee lawyer who asked the question was so impressed that he answered Jesus, had said had Jesus had answered very rightly. In these words, we see that the commandments of Scripture are applications of two commandments, love God and love others. These are the clearest guides for us concerning whether our emotions are righteous or are they sinful. Let's look at Jesus for a clearer picture of this idea. In the life of Jesus, we see the full range of emotions, sorrow, anger, patience, compassion, mercy, long-suffering, humility, joy, and peace. In Christ, we see weeping at the tomb of Lazarus. We see anger at the, as he chases the thieves out of the temple. We see patience with his disciples, compassion with the children, mercy with the woman caught in adultery, and joy as his reason for enduring the cross. Every emotion that was displayed in the life of Christ was an expression of, of loving God and loving people. His emotions were never self-serving. They were never manipulative. They were always in the same way an extension of his love for us. He is our example of living life to the fullest with God honoring emotions. That is where the gap between him and us ends really. Uh, so many times our emotions are not a loving expression for God or the people around us. Our emotions are often self-centering, self-serving, and um, following our sinful agenda. To know if our emotions are righteous or sinful, we ask the question, are my emotions an expression of my love for God and for others, or are they an expression of us loving ourselves? It is, is it possible to live with holy emotions. Yes, yes it is. But we live in a fallen world and we, are, we were fallen. Because of that, our desires and our emotions are so easily led to the wrong place. They lead us to join the Apostle Paul, oh Paul in regret when he writes in Romans seven nineteen that he does what he does not want to do and what he does, what he longs to do, he does not do. Romans seven nineteen he says, for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Our emotions have led us badly, but in reality, they were never meant to lead us at all. Our emotions were meant to follow as we follow God. Well, if we look back to Scripture, we will see that our emotions point us back to, uh, to the emotions of our, uh, the conditions of our heart, and our hearts are controlled by our desires. The writer in Proverbs 4.23 instructs us in this way, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. There are verses all throughout Scripture that communicate this idea to us. Our words, our actions, and our emotions are all an overflow of what is in our hearts. As stated in Luke chapter 6, 43 and 45, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. And verse 45, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. The words of Jesus here. You see, the condition of a person's heart will determine how they will live their life and how they will express their emotions. At times, it has been said that if you are having problems with your anger, then count to ten. 
each time that you're tempted to be angry, and that'll fix the problem. The truth is this kind of a solution is like putting a Band-Aid on a heart attack. Our problem is at the heart level, and only God can transform our hearts. Psalms 51, verse 10, we need a heart transplant. Create in me a pure heart, O Lord, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That is what the gospel is. And we were spiritually dead in sin, but now those who have repented of their sin and put their faith in Jesus have been given the heart of Christ. From that, we now have the resources that we need to walk in holiness, even in the area of our emotions. We now must submit, surrender, and ask for God's transforming work in our lives when we sin against our spouses, our roommates, our children, or our co-workers. We must confess our sin and beg for God's transforming work in our hearts that we may love others through our emotions. The resulting humility will drive us back to God's word, back to his people, and back to prayer. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will change, he'll give you the desires of your heart. And our emotions will follow with that change. He will give us new desires and affections, and we will begin to, uh, to, to long for the things that God longs for. We must admit that the problem starts with us and the solution is found in him. Our emotions are determined by the condition of our hearts, but we are also affected by the level of our faith. Our emotions are affected by what we believe about ourselves and what we believe about the world around us and, that, and what we believe about God. We see examples about this throughout Scripture. For example, we see David, the shepherd boy, who faced the giant Goliath. We would expect that David would be afraid, but there was no fear in him. As time passed, uh, David was blessed, victorious, and became well-known. In Samuel 1, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, it talks about this. And King Saul became jealous and chased Samuel around the countryside, trying to kill him. At 1 Samuel 19, 9 through 11, at two different times, um, David found himself in a place where he could easily strike King Saul down. But both times, David refused. We see no hint of revenge in David. 1 Samuel 19, uh, 9 through 11 says, But an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the harp, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear, but David eluded him as Saul drove his spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it, watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michal, his wife, David's wife, warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through a window, and he fled and escaped. But I digress. Here we go. Back to emotions. <laughs> David's emotions seem to be uh, totally, uh, to totally ignore his situation, it is as if he was living in a different reality. His emotions often did the unexpected. The unseen realities of God were more real to him than the seen situations that he found himself in. This was because one's emotions are affected by one's faith in God. As we walk near to God, he becomes our dominant reality and our emotions respond accordingly. David had experienced the faithfulness of God so many times that God, his word and his faithfulness were more real to David than anything else. We see this type of behavior in various other stories in the Bible. In the book of Acts, the disciples were beaten when meeting with the religious and political figures in Jerusalem 
as they were leaving that San, the Sanhedrin, Scripture says that they were rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Christ. You'll find that in, story in Acts 5, verse 40 and 41. His speech, that was Gamaliel, the Pharisee, persuaded them, the Sanhedrin, and they called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. We would expect anger or fear, but they rejoiced. We see another example in the life of Paul. And then there was Paul. Wow. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 11.25 about how he had been beaten and whipped. Let me include 2 Corinthians uh, 11.24 and 25. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea, hungry, without sleep. And in, in Acts 14, 19, almost stoned to death. And then some Jews, in 14, 19, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. I'd like to add verse 20. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city, probably to preach again. Amazing. Praise God. Amen. After coming through these experiences, we would expect um, fear, anger, bitterness, or a, or a lack of faith. But instead, Paul tells how he had found contentment in all things. In Philippians 4, 10 through 13, he said, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is. It, what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Amen. When those in Scripture trusted in God and walked with him through obedience, they be, they came to know to know God through life's experience. They no longer just knew about him. They now had come to know him personally. Time and time again, we read about it, how it affected uh, not only their lives, but also their emotions. In summary, in other words, we cannot know the truth of a situation until we have heard God's perspective about it. In all these cases, that were given. The people in the Bible were viewing their situation from God's perspective. They recognized his wisdom and his power and his faithfulness, and their emotions followed. So even in the midst of this coronavirus, may we beg God to reveal to us his perspective. And remember, let me add Psalm 91 here. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. And you will not fear for the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand 
may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. We will call, he will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. May our, emotion, may our emotions not be like those who have no God, but may our emotions be, emotions be submitted to the fact that we belong to a sovereign God who is eternally faithful. And we know that all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who loved him, who have been called according to his purpose, as Romans 8, 28. As we begin to love rightly and believe rightly, we will see our emotions begin to change and bring glory to God as we become more like Jesus. So in closing, may I, may I ask, may we ask for forgiveness of those we have sinned against with our emotions, if we have been unkind, impatient, ill-tempered, or selfish. May we share with them our heart of repentance and invite them to walk with us as we seek to be better. May we read and spend more time in God's word so we can may grow in faith. <clears throat> and may we pray continually as we humbly ask for God's help to transform our hearts and our emotions. And may we seek to spend time with other Christian brothers and sisters even if it needs to be online during these days of quarantine. In these days of quarantine, may the extended time with our families provide us with ample opportunity to be transformed in the area of our emotions as we humble ourselves before God. So, my friends, what is the condition of your heart? Is God calling you to be closer to him? Are you longing to be closer to him? Be sure many are praying for you for this to be your choice. Let us pray. Father, Lord God, we submit our lives and surrender to you. When we sin against others, we sin against you, Lord. We ask, no, we beg for your Holy Spirit and transforming work on our hearts. We delight in you, Lord, and ask that you will change the desires of our hearts so that in the emotions that we express, we represent you to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.